Welcome to another edition of Liberated Perspectives on the Nimburu Media Collective. I'm your host, Solomon, and joined in studio today. It's an honor and a pleasure to be joined by Princess Tatsy, journalism major at University of Maryland. And uh, she's my co-host, you know, last week's uh, co-hosted a podcast with me. That was fantastic. Great job. Thank yeah. You. So thank you for joining for joining us today. And we, again, I mean, we're, we're on a roll. We've, we've got another amazing guest, another amazing guest. And and really, it's it's you know we have a guest that that should need no introduction, but he's going to get an introduction nonetheless. And I'm going to welcome on Sylvester James Gates, Jim Gates Jr. is is a theoretical physicist at the University of Maryland College Park, Maryland. He is a John S. Toll Professor of Physics and currently holds the Clark Leadership Chair in Science. He is a distinguished university professor and serves as Professor of Physics in the Department of Physics, as well as Professor of Public Policy in the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland. Dr. Gates served on the Uni uh, United States President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, uh, 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 at the same time on the, uh, the Maryland State Board of Education from 2009 to 2016, and on the National Commission on Forensic Science from the year 2013 to 2016. Dr. Gates is known for his work on supersymmetry, supergravity, and superstring theory. He received two BS degrees and a PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, also known as MIT, where his doctoral thesis was the institution's first on the topic of supersymmetry. In 1984, Gates co-authored Superspace, the first comprehensive book on supersymmetry. He is a past president of the National Society of Black Physicists and an NSEP. VP Fellow, as well as a Fellow of the American Physical Society, Physical Society, the American Association for Advancement of Science and the Institution of Physics in the UK. In August of 2021, Professor Gates was the recipient of the 2021 Andrew Gurement Award. In March 2020, Professor Gates was elected to the Mathematical Mathematical Sciences Research Institute, also known as MSIR, Board of Trustees. He was elected as a fellow of the South African Institute of Physics beginning in May 2021. In 2019, he was elected to the presidential line of the APS, where he is currently serving as the past president. He is also an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Society. In 2013, he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences, becoming the first African-American theoret theoretical physicist so recognized in his 150 year history. President Obama awarded Professor Gates the National Medal of Science as at the White House ceremony in 2013. And, and uh, you know, I appreciate that. And, and I, I wanna, you know, give Sylvester Gates, Jim Gates, Dr. Gates, a warm welcome. And I, and I wanna say this before we, before we um, um, really get things rolling. And I, um, you know, I, I have a first question, but before I get to my first question, I, I, I wanna say this. Um, uh, Dr. Gates, you know, with all due, you know, candor to everyone that's watching right now, um, you know, I was raised, you know, both my parents have their terminal degrees and I've always, was always around, um, you know, really educated black folks that, that either had degrees. I mean, some folks, you know, were bus drivers that were very educated, self, self-taught, very knowledgeable. They were part of, you know, my village. And but I was always taught, even by the folks that that had, um, you know, terminal degrees, that they were always men and women of the people. And I want to say this: as as accomplished as Dr. Gates is, he's a very, very, very humble man. I mean, you know, I got a chance to meet him last semester. You know, came to a Black Male Initiative meeting, and it's just very down to earth, a humble person. Um, you know his accomplishments were things that that he had, that he's done and has earned. You know, and and has had. And we're gonna get into this. People that influenced him in his life, like his father, his his parents. You know, um, we're gonna get into that. But one of the things I appreciate about you is how accessible you are, and I think that's why students enjoy taking your classes and being taught by you because you're very very accessible. You 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 come across that way, and and I you know um, it just seems that you live your life that way. As you know that you want to be accessible to the people to share. Um, the brilliant knowledge that you've acquired over so many years. So thank you for making the time to come on and, and, and spend this next hour with us. Well, uh, Solomon, thank you for that uh, 
gracious welcome and, and thank uh, the princess behind you for going over some of my work. Um, look, you know, I tell people that uh, I, I do things because I enjoy being a doorway for people to walk through into a better future. And so, you know, I've taught for 51 straight years, uh, you know, calculus and, and physics. I'm having a whale of a time doing that. I'm 72 years old these days. And, uh, you know, I don't really understand why people get full of themselves, quite frankly, because uh, there's always someone who can run faster than you, jump higher, has a better fade away, you know. And yeah. so I'm very much aware of that. Maybe, you know, it's, I've been lucky. Uh, I've done a lot of things, but there's always someone I can look up to. And uh, so no one is at the no person is at the pinnacle. And that's that's my my attitude about these kinds of things. I appreciate it. Yep. Appreciate it. So I, I wanted to ask you, go on, I want to go and start at your beginnings. When did you know that you wanted to be a physicist? And 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 how did that come to be? Uh, well, uh, if if you allow me to share a screen, I'll show you part of that story. If, sure. Because uh, I, I have some images from my childhood that might be useful for your audience. Uh, as I was saying, about to say, when I was four years old, um, well, first of all, let me go back. My dad spent 25 years in the U.S. Army. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 1942, he married my mom. Uh, they got married in San Antonio, Texas. And then he went off to war. He was in the Second World War. And a group that's relatively well known in, in the African-American community called the Red Ball Express. At least some of your older, more mature people will know what the Red Ball Express is. My dad was a driver in the Red Ball Express. And... Uh, he stayed in the army for uh, into the 60s. And as a consequence, in, in 1953, I found myself as a four-year-old kid in St. John's, Newfoundland in Canada. Wow. And my mother, who at that point had three kids and one on the way, uh, took uh, the three kids to a movie. The movie was called Spaceways. I think it's the first movie I ever saw in my life. And, uh, oh, I, I see that I can share now. It looks like I can share. So I can show you these pictures. Um, so I think it's the first movie uh, I've, I ever saw in life. It's certainly the first movie I ever remember seeing. And uh, I'm trying to bring up pictures of mom and dad here for you. That's my mother and father. Picture wow. taken of dad in 1962. Wow. Picture of mom in 1942. And so, as I said, uh, in 1953, because he was still in the army, I lived in this place, St. John's, Newfoundland. It was a, a U.S. military base there. And the two lower pictures that you see on this image are pictures of that army base. Uh, they also had the picture on the right-hand side shows some of the living quarters in the background of the picture. And so that's where we live. There was a theater on that army base. And so my mother took her kids to see a movie, and this is the movie. It's oh. called Switch Ways. <laughs> and what, as a four-year-old kid, what I understood from this movie was that science <laughs> was a gateway to fun and adventure. What else would a four-year-old boy want in life? And so that evening, I told my parents, as my dad, when he came home from work, that I wanted to be a scientist. And so that's where it started for me. I'll stop sharing now and you know, we have more stuff like that if you if you want to get into it thank you for that. that no that was awesome that was awesome so you want to ask the next question yes so you told us about your influences and how movies in influence your decision to become a scientist so tell us about especially your parents like what role did they play oh thank you francis oh wow what a question well first of all let me talk about my dad Actually, let me go back to talk about my grandfather. So grandfather was a sugarcane farmer in Marengo County, Alabama. Mm -hmm. um, Joseph was his name. Uh, he and my grandmother split up. And so uh, part of my father's childhood, he was raised by his mother up until about age 12. And then at 12, he moved to the farm with his father, Joseph. And when, from that point on in his childhood, he was raised on the farm. Now, my grandfather uh, owned some land. He wasn't a sharecropper. He actually owned the land that he farmed to raise the sugar cane. And 
at the age, and it was my grandfather's hope to pass on the land to his son, my father. But at age 12, my father told him that he didn't, he, he would not stay on the farm and that he, he would go out into the world and, and find a, a better life for himself. Now, how a 12 year old kid comes to have that kind of self knowledge, I do not understand, but that was my father. Uh, one other interesting thing, fact about my grandfather, which has been reflected in my father's life, my life, and also my children's life, is my father, grandfather could neither read nor write, but he could do arithmetic. And people wonder how that's possible. Well, I remind folks that in agrarian societies, in farming uh, communities, often farmers have to get, uh, buy seed and get farming implements on credit. And then you use them, you bring in your harvest, you sell the harvest, and then you have money to pay back the store owners. And so there were ledgers kept about this. And it turned out that grandfather learned arithmetic so that he would he and other members of the Black community around him could uh, have confidence that they weren't being cheated on the uh, ledgers about repaying loans. So that's the that's the, the that's some of the ground fertile ground from which I sprung my father my mother as you could see from the picture was kind of a glamorous person it's really <laughs> quite interesting that my mother and father got together at all from what I know about them uh, my dad tells a story about uh, he and some of his uh, buddies were in a bar called Tucker's and uh, they were uh, getting trained in the army getting ready to go off to war and my dad said that the, this uh, group of women came in and there was this one very beautiful woman. She loved to dance. And even though he didn't dance, he got up the nerve to ask her to dance. And that's, that was my start, apparently, of a, a dance in a bar. Oh, gosh. And I, I wanted to ask you, thank, thank you for that. Um, wanted to ask you a question about, the, I, saw, I saw a video on you and you were talking about your first, your first encounter with inequality in education. Yes. And I, I, I thought it was really profound. And I wanted to know if you could talk about that, if you could talk about it on this interview, because I think it would be real sure. good for our viewers. Sure. Well, first of all, let me talk about it in several different ways. Uh, again, for you and your audience, uh, if you use Google and you type James Gates, Orlando Public Library, uh, that will lead you to a link that talks about my time as a teenager in Orlando, Florida, because uh, although by the time I had been in sixth grade, six schools, by the time I was in sixth grade, I spent all of my high, uh, teenage years in Orlando. And that's where I really learned about racism and the what it, what it does. But I learned about it in a, the city was segregated. So one uh, in Orlando, and many people have been to Orlando because that's where Disney World is located. And some of them have made their way to downtown Orlando. But if you go to downtown Orlando, there's a street called Division Street. And it's right next to the railroad tracks. And on the east side of Division Street was basically where the historic European American community uh, had their homes and businesses. And on the west side of Division Street and the railroad tracks, was with it was it was where the traditional home of the African American community was. It's it's currently called the Paramore District. And so uh, there was one school in Orlando, one high school rather, where African Americans get could get a high school education. It's called Jones High School, and that's where I attended high school. Uh, a friend of mine named Philip Dunn uh, one day uh, challenged me and taught me how to play chess. And we had these intense chess matches and guys would be gathered around the table because, you know, you know how competitive young men are. I mean, we can't help the testosterone. You know, it comes out in all kinds of ways. And so Philip and I used to have these just epic chess uh, matches and guys start gathering around us and they want to learn how to play. And so by the time we were in 10th grade, we, Philip and I formed and the, the other guys, and I actually have pictures of that chess team someplace in my yearbook, but Unfortunately, I didn't know that I didn't know we were going to go. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, can I still share share screen? Yeah, you can. Because mm -hmm. I can show you that chess team. I just realized I did upload that picture. So here we go with that. Okay. Oh. Uh, 
This is our Jones High School Chess Club. Oh from my 1969. God. And so you can see I'm uh, the person that standing up in the middle is my youngest brother, William. Uh, in this picture, I'm on the left, his left side. Philip uh, is on the right hand side of the picture next to uh, Mr. Brody, who was one of the teachers at Jones High. And the gentleman sitting in front of us was another teacher at Jones High. So they were our chess club sponsors. And so we got so good that we decided to challenge every other high school in Orlando that had a chess team, mm -hmm. and we never lost a match. Wow. But what that did for me was also allowed me to see the insides of what we used to call the white high schools, right? Places where we couldn't go, where we right. could not go to school. And I could see that the investment in the furniture and the desk and the books and the quality of the building was far different than what we had at Jones High. And so my, you know, what I learned from that experience was that I lived in a society that was betting against me because of the disinvestment that is uh, in education that's available to African Americans. And this goes on to this very day. I mean, this is not something people think is somehow in the past. This is a large part of the reason why uh, programs like what's called affirmative action, if there's going to be fairness in the educational system in this country for people of the African diaspora, uh, if affirmative action is removed and it looks like it's going to be, it means we will return to the patterns of this country that I experienced as a child and that my parents experienced where African-American and people of the African diaspora simply right. will not have the same level of investment in their education as people of other ethnicities. That's right. I appreciate that. Yeah, and you're, you're exactly right, 100% right. And, and folks watching now, um, you know, what Dr. Gates says is so true, and that's why it's important for us to not be, you know, passive bystanders. We need to get involved, you know, and, and begin to mobilize and organize you know, to, to try to thwart and, uh, you know, what's coming down the pike and how do we, how do we organize around that? And how do we ensure that, you know, um, you know, that these teachings are, are carried out and, and that, you know, people, as, as you said, people, we don't return to that because if, if we return to that, as you know, there are going to be a whole legion of, of youth that are not going to have the same opportunities as their European American counterparts, you know, by this. Yep. And it's it, a, a shocking fact, uh, which a friend of mine who uh, is in the National Academy of Sciences, who is a doctor, uh, informed me about two years ago that the number of African Americans going to medical school two years ago is less than the number of African Americans who went to medical school in 1919. Oh my goodness. There are, there are many, many disparities that uh, give an accurate picture of what's going on with the opportunities for people of the African diaspora in this country, as opposed to the sort of the glossy pictures that you would believe from watching the media and what have you. Wow. Princess. Okay. So looking at your education record, you have a wonderful record when it comes to where you've gone, what, where you've studied. So we want to start with your first college experience, MIT. So how and why did you decide to apply to MIT? Like what influenced you to go there? What drew you to the school? Sure. So earlier we told the story how at four years old, uh, I told my father I want to become a scientist when I grew up. So that was in uh, Canada. Uh, my biological mother unfortunately died when I was 11 years old. And so a year later, my father remarried and my stepmother was a second grade teacher in Orlando, Florida. That's how I came to spend all of my teenage years in Orlando. Um, so I um, watched a lot of TV, <laughs> like most kids. It's something that I would never do now because <laughs> TV is not actually good for you, but that's a whole nother discussion. Um, but I watched a lot of TV and one of the programs I saw was entitled Make Room for Daddy. And in this pro, it was a it was a basically kind of a situation in comedy about the adventures of a family that lived in uh, an apartment. I think it was in New York. And one in one episode, they had a cousin or a relative come to visit them, 
And this relative was really supposed to be like this genius kid, really bright. And uh, he was already in college. And so they were talking about colleges. And in this program, it said that he was a student at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And so, you know, this probably happened when I was around 14. And, you know, kids at that age have all kinds of delusions about themselves. And so I, my father, from the time I had begun first grade, would always ask us, his four kids at dinner, what college are you going to go to um, when you uh, finish uh, school, high school? And, you know, I remember being asked this question when I was in first and second grade, and I thought, college, does that mean like grade 13? What is that? I don't know what that is. And uh, from this program, I understood, and my understanding was, MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, was a place, I thought, where they only made you study mathematics and science. <laughs> you see, I called that the good stuff. Mm -hmm. and so I immediately, uh, that night when Dad came home and said, what college do you want to go to? I had an answer. I want to go to MIT. Now, I should also tell you another a little a factoid about me. Many times when I send people email, at the bottom of the email, it says, Please overlook all uh, errors in grammar, spelling, and punctuation, because mathematics is my first language, and English is my second. That is not completely a joke, because it turns out when I was in first and second grade, learning how to read and write, I already knew how to do arithmetic before I got to first and second grade, at least some simple arithmetic. I could count to 20 or 30 or something, and I knew how to add, but learning to read and write was actually difficult for me. So... Uh, I've always, I mean, it's really, and, uh, and like I said, my grandfather was into arithmetic, but he couldn't read or write at all. I mean, so mathematics has been kind of a recurring theme in our family for about four generations now. And so I had an answer. Uh, I want to go to MIT. And uh, at eight, this was like 1965 or 64. If I had applied, I would have not been admitted to MIT because MIT like most major universities, like the University of Maryland, like uh, all the large publics in the country, there were very few opportunities for people of the African diaspora to get a college education in these organizations. That changed in 1969 uh, when um, officials at the college decided that partially under the influence of the civil rights movement and the things that Dr. King was advocating for, but also because of the activities of people like Malcolm X. I mean, one has to be have a complete 360 degree picture of how the progress is made. But under the those influences, uh, universities kind of decided it was okay uh, for uh, people of color, uh, people of the African, uh, African diaspora to be admitted as students. So when 1969 rolls around, I graduate from high school, I take the SATs and what's called the achievement tests. And my SAT scores are okay. My score in physics is actually fantastic. And that's not my doing, or at least not completely my doing. Uh, I had this fantastic physics teacher at Jones High School named Mr. Freeman Coney. And he prepared me to do well on the test. And so uh, because of my performance, the um, uh, university started to write to me to invite me to apply, and MIT was one of them. But at age 19, and because of my experiences in Orlando, I quite well knew that um, there's likely no chance I would be admitted to such a place. And so even though I got this letter of invitation, I, didn't, I did not apply immediately. And then my father came to my rescue for yet the nth, nth time. Because I told you, my dad was a fantastic father. And um, uh, one day after work, he said, uh, did you apply to that place, MIT? Isn't that the place you were talking about four years ago or three years ago? And I said, yes, that's the same school. And he said, well, have you applied? And I said, no, dad. I said, dad, you know, they don't let people like us go to places like that. And he said, you're going to apply. All they can do is tell you no. And even though it was my heart's greatest desire to go there, I had understood how racism limits opportunities for people of color as an 18-year-old, and I had onboarded that 
as uh, a belief. And this, this kind of reduction in one's horizons of opportunities is something that I experienced in Orlando. And again, for young people of color, this continues to this very day. My father forced me to apply to the school I had dreamt about going to for three years. And to my very great surprise, they admitted me. Wow, I appreciate that. That, um, yeah, thank you for for going in deep context with that. You you saw you started off um, at the onset of this interview talking about the fact that you've been teaching for 51, 52 straight years. So clearly, um, you must have some type of desire, enjoyment that that is derived from from the classroom, from teaching. I, I wanted to know if you can talk about why you enjoy teaching so much. And, and then on the tail end of that, can you tell us who James Edward Young? <laughs> uh, tell, tell us about James Edward Young. <laughs> sure. Um, let's see. Let me start with trying to answer your question about uh, teaching. Um, so I started teaching in 1972. It was the first time I taught um, university students. And um, I was really surprised at how the role of a teacher allows one to, in some sense, look inside the minds of the people who's, that are sitting in front of you. Because, I mean, unless you've actually taught, you don't really know the access that you have to other people's thoughts. But the first time I stepped in the classroom and saw that, I was utterly amazed uh, at that. And again, if you let me share, I'll show you a picture of me teaching in uh, 1975. I'd love to see it. Okay, so let me try to get that up. <laughs> oh, oh, nice. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, I tell people you've never, never had a calculus teacher look that cool. Power to the people. Yes, right on. <laughs> so that picture, uh, I only found out it existed about 10 years ago. A friend of mine pointed me towards it. And as soon as I saw it, I remember exactly the day that it was taken. But I had forgotten that uh, there had that the picture had actually been taken. So I was teaching a class in limits, what they call limits, is one of central uh, concepts of calculus. And so uh, a, a few, I should, I, I can still share. So let me show you one other picture. Uh, is, um, is there a picture on the screen now that you can see? No. No, okay, so let me share, like I said, one other picture because Wow. I hope a picture's up now. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. You can see the kid with the goofy hat, that would be me. And the guy pointing at me was a professor at MIT by the name of Brian Schwartz. Uh, one day while I was uh, teaching my class in calculus, he stood outside the door and was listening. And when the class was over and I came out, because I didn't know he was there, he said, you know, you look like you really enjoy teaching. And I said, yes, I do. And then he said, would you like to be a good teacher? <laughs> which, which is a very interesting statement. Because <laughs> I, said, I wasn't already a good teacher, even though I was very enthusiastic. And so he, t he was my mentor about teaching. He's the person who actually got me to think about what is it? What do you have to do in order to be a good teacher? He's the first person to raise that issue with me. And so, of course, I will be eternally grateful. He showed me some of the tricks of the trade, so to speak. And um, that's, uh, yes, I derive very, very great pleasure from teaching because, um, like I said, he, he got me to thinking about what it takes to be a good teacher. Right. And, and who... And James Edward Young. James Edward Young was my PhD thesis advisor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He was the first African-American uh, physics professor in the history of MIT. But he was also an alum of MIT. I think it was 1952, he actually got his PhD uh, from MIT. So he was my advisor and... Um, he was a perfect advisor for me because he let me do exactly what I wanted to do as, as a scholar and researcher, whereas most advisors try to t tell you what to do. He let me sort of follow my own intuition 
uh, because I I was pretty sure I knew how to build a career and I knew what I wanted to do. For me, the only question was, would the world allow me to do what I wanted to do? And that that's a whole different issue. And so um, he was my advisor. And interestingly enough, he was the advisor of one other um, one other African American student in physics. She was a few years before me, and her name was Shirley Jackson. Uh, not too many people know sh about Shirley, or not enough people know about Shirley who should know about her. But she was the second African American to get a PhD in the history of this country. She got her PhD, I think it was in seventy two or seventy three. Uh, the first African American woman to get a PhD was a woman named Willie uh, May Hobbs, who got her PhD one or two years earlier from the University of Michigan uh, in physics. And so, Professor Young uh, has this legacy that he produced uh, at MIT, namely both Shirley and I were his students. Okay, so you want to know a little bit about what you teach. So we have a question about what is supersymmetry in layman's terms. Oh my goodness. <laughs> we want to learn. Folks, you folks are just going to run me through the room. <laughs> but fortunately, you're not the first people to do this. So let me, uh, again, because I give lots and lots and lots of talks, uh, <laughs> I have lots and lots of resources, and I have a library of images. That's what I keep calling up as you, um, as you, um, query me. And so I can answer your question by calling up another image. I'm glad, glad you have these pictures. Yeah, I've enjoyed them a lot. No, thank you so much. And uh, I assume I can still share. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, most people have never seen this because what they've seen instead is if you walk into a high school chemistry class, you see something that looks like this or biology class. This is the, the table of elements. But when the table of elements was first created by uh, a scientist named Mendeleev, it looked like this. Now, part of the reason why I like, I, I, when I give talks, why I like to have both of these images is to try to get people to understand that science is always changing. Science is not something that sits still. It changes, it evolves, it grows. And so the original table of Mendeleev looked like this, but nowadays, as you can see, there are holes and pe uh, people, he actually used these holes to exist, to um, predict the existence of new elements. In today's table of elements, uh, there are, aside from this one element here, everything else has been observed in the laboratory. And so those holes that he predicted elements have all been filled in. So now to answer your question, um, let me do this in uh, two phases. First of all, I'm gonna take us on a little journey. So uh, tell me what you're seeing. Looks like the Superman logo. Great, okay, great. Okay, so it is the Superman logo, but I use it for supersymmetry because you were asking about supersymmetry. I'm trying to get to explain it, but we're gonna uh, take a little journey here. I'll start this movie. You'll see that these clock marks uh, are appearing on the side of the screen. Mm -hmm. Let me stop the movie and talk about them. Suppose I had a yardstick. It's about, I got my arm spread out about the distance of yardstick. Suppose I take that yardstick, cut it into 10 equal pieces, throw away nine and keep one. How long is a piece that I keep? It's about something like this. Everybody agree? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, now suppose I take that remaining piece cut it into 10 equal parts, throw away nine and keep one. I get something about as broad as my fingernail. All right. Right? So question, how many times, well, each of these hash marks that you see on the side of this clock is means that you've done this process once. This is called powers of 10. So I hope I've given a clear explanation of what it means to say a power of 10. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this movie is about powers of 10 and where atoms are. So we're going to start moving pretty fast at the beginning. So you can see this little indicator starting to move up in the corner. And then at 10 to the minus 5, that's the size of blood cells. So you take this process we described, and you do it five times, and you get to something as big as a blood cell. Wow. If you do it uh, some more, 
So we're going to continue our little journey. Six, seven, eight, nine is strands of DNA. So you can see this way of thinking about things gets you to smaller and smaller sizes very, very quickly. And now we'll continue the movie. And at 10 to the minus, that means you do the process 10 times. We get 10 to the minus 10, which is what you see on the side. You enter the realm of the atom. Almost nobody knows how big the atom is. You can walk down the streets and ask people, you ever heard of atoms, atomic power? Everybody says, oh, yeah, yeah. And then you can ask, well, how big is an atom? And people have no idea. Well, this is one way to explain as a story how big an atom is. If you can explain powers of 10, you can tell people how big atoms are. That's why I developed this film. By the way, this film comes from a video series I did for a company called The Teaching Company. And the name of the series is called Super String Theory, The DNA of Reality. So I created, had these animations created for that video presentation. So this is the kind, this uh, begins to show you the kind of parts of the universe that I study. Uh, people have heard the nucleus of the nuclear energy, right? How big is the nucleus of an atom compared to the atom? Well, the answer, again, we're going to see in the movie, 10 to the minus 10 is the atom. Wow. 10 to the minus 15 gets you to the nucleus. Hmm. The size of the atom to the nucleus is the same as the size of us to those blood cells that we saw at the beginning of uh, this presentation. So people like me use mathematics to study these kinds of things. And now I can answer your question about what's supersymmetry, because that's what you asked me. Mm -hmm. So let me uh, stop sharing, get out of this. Go back to Mendeleev. So we're back to the table of elements, but these elements are actually atoms. So just like in our movie, you can imagine going inside of these um, elements and seeing what's there. And when, if you do that, what you will find is what you see on this set of images here. You will find, for example, the electron, that's what this symbol E stands here. Everybody knows about electrons and electronics, but they're parts of an atom. They're inside of that, that number of 10 to the minus 10 is about the distance that they orbit around the nucleus. But in the nucleus, there are objects called quarks. So you can see those over here in red, my cursor is circling around them. And the electron, which is E, is a member of a family of objects. So there's another particle in nature called the muon, and I'm pointing to them right now. It's a particle that looks exactly like the electron, except that it, it has 200 times more mass. Um, when I was in college, another copy was discovered. This is an object called a tau particle, and it looks exactly like the electron, except that it is, has 1,700 times the mass of the electron. Inside of protons and neutrons, you find these things called quarks, and that's what these red arrows represent. Also, um, you probably heard of particles of light, because you can see. Well, particles of light are the carriers of electromagnetic force. And in nature, it turns out there are uh, four fundamental forces, and the carriers for three of them are all up here in this box. And now I can finally explain to you what's supersymmetry. First question, if you look at this image, does it look pretty or balanced to you? Yeah. Is you think it looks balanced? I think it looks pretty. You think, uh, is it balanced? No, there's not. There's not. I don't see the symmetry. Right. And that's the key point. Humans, it turns out, are really intrinsically key to see symmetries. And this picture is not symmetrical. But <clears throat> this may not be all there is to our universe. Suppose our universe actually looks like this when you look at the little particles. Is this more symmetrical? Yes, it is. This is the notion of supersymmetry. Now, you might wonder what it, about, wait a minute, uh, you said that this is what we know from science, and yet, in order to get symmetry, we need this. You would say, well, hey, wait a minute, but I'd like to remind you, the initial Mendeleev table had holes in it. It only became more symmetrical when our technology let us find all those other elements. 
And so although today, this is all we see with advances in technology in the future, it may allow us to see the rest of the story. And that's the mathematics I have spent my career working on. Okay. This is brilliant. Yeah, and and you're I, I, aren't you like the, I mean this is this is this is you. This is your theory, right? This is what I work on. I I I didn't invent supersymmetry, but I've I have made major contributions to the ideas, including um using symbols to replace the mathematics of this stuff. Right. These symbols are all are an invention of mine, together with another physicist named Michael Fox. And these symbols, curiously enough, uh, when you in mathematics and theoretical physics, when you have a new idea, you get to name it just like you name your children. And so Michael Fox, who's a European American physicist, and I in 2006 invented these symbols to replace some of the mathematics, because it turns out the symbols are an efficient, more efficient way to think about some problems. We call these symbols adinkras. Yes. The word yeah. adinkra, the word adinkra, I see you shaking your head, Solomon. Yeah. The word adinkra comes from West Africa because it's one of the visual traditions of the uh, of the Akan people in West Africa. And the word basically means a symbol with hidden meaning. And so when we found these pictures that encompass our mathematics, uh, Michael and I said, we're going to call these things adinkras. So a large part, you asked me about my stuff. This is actually my stuff. Brilliant. Yeah, I appreciate, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. That gives me, it gives us a lot of insight, a lot of insight of your work. And I also know that you're, you're by far not, you know, to use the term, you, you're not a one trick pony. You, you um, have a lot of other interests. And so I, you know, Given the fact that we we have often on this show have had guests on and, and also we've covered shows that have to do with a rich contextual history, um, especially um, about people of the African diaspora and, and um, their culture and so forth. And I wanted to I wanted to ask you a question about who is Alexander can you, um, El Edward Alexander Boucher? Who was Ah uh, yes, please. Please tell us. Okay, so again, um, I let me start by asking you and your audience a question just for a moment, and then, then I'll answer it. Um, what in what field did the first African American get a PhD? Was it business or religion or medicine? What field do you think it was? And this is just a rhetorical question. You can try to answer it if you want. If you and Princess both want to try to answer, I'm happy to hear your answers. Was it medicine? Was it re uh, religion? Ph uh, philosophy? What do you think? Science. She says science. I would say something in, within science or mathematics. Most African Americans would not give that as an answer. The answer turns out actually to be physics. The first African American to get a PhD in anything, it wasn't in divinity school, it wasn't in medical school, it was in physics. His name is Edward Alexander Boucher. Um, if, if you allow me to go out on the web, because I didn't know you were going to go here, uh, I can find some pictures of uh, him by simply Googling his name and getting some images, if you think that would be useful for your audience. Sure. Yeah, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. okay, so here we go. And, you know, I love technology because it, it gives, as you can see, the way I use stuff, um, it is... Um, kind of an extension of what I do as a teacher. And when I get a question that I didn't know you were going to ask me, <laughs> if it's not in my library, I can find it online. So I'm going to type in Edward uh, Boucher. And then I'm going to tell you about him. Okay. The uh, this is Edward when he graduated from Yale University mm. in 1786. I'm sorry, 18. I'm sorry. 1876, he graduated. He's the first African American to get a PhD in anything. He was the tenth person in the history of the United States to get a PhD in physics. Uh, this is Edward as an older gentleman. Um, 
as you might imagine, uh, this is 1876. 1876 is a, a very interesting date in African American history. So let me tell you a little bit about it. That was uh, so in the Civil War ended in 1865. And in the period from 1865 to 1876, you had a substantially large number of African Americans who got elected to Congress, who got elected to uh, uh, political positions and uh, state representatives and, and uh, mayors and what have you. That happened all the way in that period from 1865 to about 1876. It kind of came to a halt in 1876. And the reason was politics. There was a presidential election that was in dispute. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, sure does. And the compromise to that dispute was to choose, I can't remember the president's name, but he was definitely not someone interested in seeing the African-American community continue to have the rights that they had experienced right after the Civil War. And as a consequence, it turns out that Jim, the Jim Crow era began and lasted all the way to the 1960s. Right. So that was the same year that when Edward Alexander Boucher got his PhD and became the first African-American to get a PhD in anything. Okay. So you've covered your experience at MIT. You've talked about, you've talked to us about supersymmetry and we want to know a little bit about your postdoc experience at Caltech. You can tell us about that. Well, first of all, you saw my hair. <laughs> when I had that circle afro, I was a postdoc at Caltech. Um, excuse me. I had a wonderful time at Caltech in the sense that it, uh, it allowed me to continue to grow as a scientist. I was there from 1980 to 1982. And um, I had some great, I had the uh, great opportunity to meet some of the world's most accomplished physicists. I'm going to show you again some pictures. You asked me, first of all, a while ago about James Edward Young. The reason I'm showing this picture is because he's in the lower right-hand corner. That's the gentleman who was my thesis advisor. Out in the upper left-hand corner of this image, you see Dr. Shirley Jackson back when she was his student. So this is back in the 70s. The other people in this uh, particular panel were mentors to me while I was at MIT. Mm -hmm. uh, these people I'm showing you now, this is Professor Mark Grissero, Professor Bruno Zamino, and Professor Peter Van Nievenhuizen were mentors to me as I was a postdoc at Harvard, because I was at Harvard from 1977 to 1980 as a postdoctoral researcher in the physics department. I was uh, what's called a junior fellow of the Society of Fellows. And I'm told that I was the second African-American scientist that Harvard had ever had uh, as a uh, junior fellow scientist. Then I went off to Caltech. This is Ramos Hall at Caltech. And this is me at Caltech, which we talked about. I wrote a book at Caltech, uh, which together with these other people, this book has, was one of the foundations of the science that I do. And then at Caltech, I met these gentlemen. The gentleman on the left is named Murray Gelman. He's a Nobel laureate. Uh, in the 60s, he's one of the people, remember I told you that inside of protons and neutrons, there are these smaller things called quarks. He's one of the first people in the world to figure that out. And as a consequence, wound up with the Nobel Prize in physics. The gentleman on the right-hand side of the picture is John Schwartz. And John Schwartz was truly my mentor. Uh, he, uh, he was part of the reason I, I came to Caltech. Uh, he chose me to be a researcher there because I was working in physics that he thought uh, was very important. He later went on to become the inventor, in fact, while I was at Caltech, of what is called superstring theory. Again, if you got some science geeks in your audience, they probably heard of string theory, that TV show, The Big Bang Theory. Yes. Well, string theory is actually super string theory. And the guy that you see on the right-hand side of this picture is its inventor. But also at Caltech, I had a chance to meet this guy. This was Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman is, was one of the, has, is one of the most brilliant, is considered to be one of the most brilliant physicists 
to have lived after Albert Einstein. Mm. And at Caltech, I was in the research group that he headed up with Dr. Gelman. And I'll tell you one Feynman story, because there are a million Feynman stories. Now that you know the name, you can go Google it. Google it. There have been movies made about this guy. But when I first got to Caltech, I had been reading about him for a decade. And so I was at this Chinese restaurant where they had all the new postgraduate researchers and graduate students and the faculty all went for lunch. And I was sitting at a table and about five feet away from me was Richard Feynman. And I thought, oh my God, <laughs> I know who this guy is. And if I say anything, he's gonna conclude I'm a dummy. So the best strategy for me to do is to sit here and not say anything. So um, I sat there and was shaking my head at conversations and he noticed this. And so he turned to me and he said, um, Mr. Gates, that's your name, isn't it? And I said, yes, Dr. Feynman. He said, you know, when uh, I was your age, I wanted to wear my hair just like that. And the that he was pointing to was the image that you are now seeing. After that interaction, I was never afraid to talk to Richard Feynman again. He entered into some levity into it, huh? Yep. Oh man, <laughs> I wanted to. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you since we're, we're talking about Caltech and and you know as we we enter the you know the the home stretch um, of this this interview that that I really am extremely appreciative of. And I'm sure that people watching this, not just within our campus community, University of Maryland, but um, throughout the World Wide Web, which is, you know, worldwide that are, are gonna get this opportunity to watch this video, um, are, are likely thoroughly enjoying. I wanted to ask you, what led you, what led you, what brought you to Maryland, to the Uni University of Maryland and why? Because you were at the, the illustrious Massachusetts Institute of Technology. What, you know, and I, I it, it, you know, please in, in all candor, because I saw you, I saw a, a really interesting interview that, that you had um, on the Compton, ser the, you know, the Compton lecture series. And, and you talked about that. What led you to leave MIT? Could you tell our audience that and, and, and what it ultimately brought you to that next phase of your life coming to University of Maryland? Sure. I'm going to do this by sharing screen once more because uh, I have an image of the person who really started me thinking about that process. So let me share screen. This gentleman here is named Abdus Salam. He was born in Pakistan and he's all, he also received the Nobel Prize uh, in the late 70s. I'm sorry, late, uh, late 70s, uh, middle of the late 70s. Uh, when I was a postdoc, I didn't have a lot of money for travel. And Dr. Salam created a research institute in Italy called the International Center for Theoretical Physics. He was also like John Schwartz and also like uh, Steve uh, Stephen Hawking. All these big names you've heard about, they were interested in the science that I and a, a group of young people were undertaking at that time. And so I got an invitation from his research institute to come and give a talk in Italy. It was my first time in Italy. And I gave my scientific talk and he was in the front of the audience. And after it, he invited me up to his office. And he, the first thing he said is, I didn't know you were black. At least that's the sentiment. I don't remember his exact words. I can only convey to you the sense of the conversation. Now, I don't know what I said in response, but I know what I was thinking. I was thinking something like, well, that's because my mathematics isn't Ebonics. It's actually mathematics that I do my work in. So there's no way for him to know. And then the second thing he said to me was something it took me a long time to understand. He said he was convinced that when a sufficient number of people, and again, I'm paraphrasing, I'm not giving exact phrase, uh, but he said, when a sufficient number of people of the African diaspora entered the field of physics, he thought it was very likely that something like jazz would appear in the discipline. Now, I was totally stunned at what he was saying to me, and I had no way to understand 
what it was that he was conveying. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But he understood things about me I didn't understand about myself. And so um, he was responsible for making sure that every summer from about 1978 to 85 or so, uh, there were research funds for me to travel and spend uh, six or eight weeks at his research center in Italy, which is it's uh, in a city called Trieste, which is uh, pretty close to Venice. Uh, Venice is a much more well-known location. And so as a consequence, um, in those days, I had about a 300-word Italian vocabulary. I, didn't, I had no grammar, but I could certainly negotiate living there because I had four or five summers worth of having to do so. On one of my visits, um, he and some of his staff <clears throat> began a discussion with me about whether I would accept an appointment uh, if they offered it at his research center. And my response was no. And he asked me a very interesting question, which was, are you married to MIT? And in my own, I, in my own mind, I, I said, no, of course not. I don't know what answer I gave, but, but then that started me thinking about, well, what actually am I seeing at MIT? Mm -hmm. So I had been a student at MIT, uh, did all my undergraduate work at MIT, did my graduate work at MIT. Uh, so I had eight years of experience as a student. In 1980, when I became a postdoc at Harvard, well, Harvard's just down the street from MIT. So I was always back visiting friends and former teachers. So that means that I have an additional three years of observing the place, so that's 11 years. And then when I was hired at MIT as, a, as an assistant professor in 1982, I got a chance to see MIT from the inside as a faculty member. And what I saw horrified me because all the time that I had been a student, I had generally been under the impression that MIT, because they talked about meritocracy and intellect and innovation, that the things that they said were also the principles that guided people. But when I got there on faculty, I could see evidence of racism in the system. And it made me very uncomfortable. And so when Professor Salam asked this question, it tied into what I was seeing. And, and as well, some experiences. I mean, my first semester at MIT, I was given an overload of teaching duties. But remember, I, I'm the kid that at Ford decided they wanted to be a research scientist. And so um, uh, I, there was this experience I had at the Harvard Coop where another uh, student that I knew named uh, Louis Alvarez Gomez and I were there and he was just appointed at uh, assistant professor at Harvard. I was appointed assistant professor at MIT. We were giving each other figuratively high fives because you know getting to be a professor is not the easiest thing in the world to do. And then I uh, we I asked him, well, what are you doing first semester? And he said, well, I've 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 been given a leave of absence, and I'm going to Princeton to study with Edward Witten. By the way, that name Edward Witten is not known outside the physics community but he's our current version of Einstein. It's not the people that you see on TV that have that degree of uh, eminence in our field. It's actually Ed. And so Louis told me he was going to join Edward first semester. And I thought to myself, well, that's interesting because I have two courses to teach this semester. And then because I'm a scientist, I said, wait a minute. You know, when you're a scientist, you get uh, the, the way you look at the world is influenced by how you do your science. And in science, one of the things that everyone's heard about Newton law, Newton's uh, F is equal MA. But one of the most interesting things about F is equal to MA is it allows you to pre predict things in the future. And so as a scientist, you get some, in the habit of thinking about how things evolve as if they're part of F is equal MA. And so I simply, in my head, I remember, let's see, how does this work? Lewis goes off to Princeton and does work with the, probably my generation's most uh, 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 accomplished physicist, 
And I go to MIT, MIT and I teach two courses. And when we come up for tenure, because all of us want to get tenure, um, people are going to say, well, let's see, who should we compare Jim to uh, in terms of his potential to be a tenured professor? Well, one of the people in that group was clearly going to be Lewis. And at that point, a bell went off in my head, just like it had when I was in high school and we had a chance to go to the, in those chess matches at the other high schools, I could see the system betting against me. And so pretty early in my experience at MIT, mentally and emotionally, I had decoupled from being there. Now, it was another two years before I actually uh, had an offer that uh, would allow me to have the kind of career I thought I had the potential of producing. And that was the University of Maryland. They came a courting. Mm -hmm. They offered me, uh, so I had two, been for two years an assistant professor at MIT, an assistant professor of applied mathematics. Uh, University of Maryland, right off the bat, offered me an associate professorship with tenure. Wow. And that's amazing because if you know the way that universities yeah. work, most people have to wait six years to get tenure. Exactly. And so, you know, Maryland right off the bat said, uh, we're offering you tenure. And, and the, part of part of for me was, this was the first time as an adult research scientist that I felt that an institution wasn't betting against me. And it was the University of Maryland at College Park. I came to visit, I found a fan, a, a physics department that is fantastically capable. In fact, it felt the same as being at Harvard, MIT, and Caltech. And that had been sort of my childhood culture as a physicist, right? Those are places I grew up as a physicist. And so there was no difference in that. And then, oh, a couple of months after I got here as, a, as an assistant professor, a few of my friends back at MIT would call me up and they would, the call would typically say, how are you doing? And then finally, there would be this one question that they asked, which is, how are things down there? <laughs> With the, you know, and, and sort of say it like that. And my response the first time I heard the question was, it was like dying and going to heaven because this institution, I, I felt the support of this institution. I know this is not a universal experience, certainly not among the faculty of color, but I personally had the support of this institution from the day I walked in the door. And that's part of the reason why I'm not that one trick pony that you mentioned a, a, mo a moment ago, I have four simultaneous careers. And that's because the University of Maryland has supported me in every single one of them. And one of those careers is as an advocate for diversity in college education. In 1995, I wrote my first essay on the subject. And in 2015, a later essay was cited by the Supreme Court when they were debating the issue of diversity and admissions for college students. One of my essays is actually cited by the case of what's called Fisher versus Texas. And I think that means I'm the only living theoretical physicist whose writings have been cited by the Supreme Court of the United States of America. Wow. That is amazing. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that is amazing. <laughs> to sit on it. Yeah, oh my gosh. Seriously. What an accomplishment, honestly. So, our next question for you is about your commercial work. So we've seen that you've done some commercials. Do you want to talk about your experience? <laughs> you like how it was set, what was going mm -hmm. on, paint the scene for us, you know? Okay, well, as you've told your commercial, uh, your your audience about my commercials, I'm going to show them. They're only about 30 seconds a piece. And uh, I also have them on my computer. Like I said, I give talks about this stuff. So I'm pretty well prepared to and you're the most show people what I do. You're by far the most prepared guest we've had. Yeah. <laughs> and so let me um, let me get uh, those uh, available to us. Um, we're going to do the first commercial, and then the second. Things have been erupting all around us. The Renaissance of sorts, recognized by those that understand that they too are big, but to shape the universe that in turn shapes them, they must align with the best. The network that has the bandwidth to help them be the best. That's not just about speed and reliability. It's about being part of a movement that moves you. 
Oh, nice, <laughs> nice. <laughs> Looking sharp too. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Yes, Marvin. Marvin, I think you have to be a brain again. It could be your own taxi. So we brought in more open out brain and that we have to use these screens to help him get started. Marvin. You got it at the same Yes, I did. You got it from here. Yes. Take his finger and press it right here. Yes. 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 Thank you. <laughs> okay. So um, I do lots of things, as you mentioned, Solomon. I, I have four careers. Let me go through them uh, so we can get it all on the table. Uh, this is my 51st consecutive year as a university level uh, instructor, college professor. Mm -hmm. uh, my next career is as a uh, theoretical research physicist. And uh, that career is 46 years long. My next career is as a, um, I would call, uh, documentary films. I've done about 20 science documentaries. Mm -hmm. And the first one is, was done in 1995. And it was a program uh, that highlighted four scientists of color. Uh, the, the four of them were a gentleman named George Castro, who was a uh, Hispanic American computer scientist. Uh, there was a um, Hispanic American female uh, space scientist by the name of France Cordoba. Uh, some of your audience may recognize that name because France just stepped down as the director of the National Science Foundation a few years ago. Uh, I was in this uh, program. It's called uh, Breakthrough, the Changing Face of Science in America. And then there was one other guy in this documentary. You know, I tell people I have a hard time remember, remember his name is Neil deGrasse, something or other. <laughs> Tyson, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Neil, so Neil, the first time uh, Neil and I, both of us uh, were in a television documentary film was this film in 1995. The film, by the way, was made by a company called Blackside. And Blackside is the company that put together a series called Eyes on the Prize, which many, many people uh, saw about the civil rights movement. Uh, in the uh, 90s or so. So they also did this film on uh, diversity in science. Uh, as I said, the uh, breakthrough, the changing face of science. So uh, I've been doing that since 95. So we're coming up almost on uh, 30 years of uh, being in science documentaries. Like I said, I've done about 20. Uh, the last science documentary I did was last November for NOVA. They call it, had something called uh, the Universe Revealed. And I was one of the I'd like to think of myself as a talking head. And interesting enough, my daughter is in that documentary because my daughter is a theoretical physicist also. Mm. Wow. Next generation. Uh, yeah, I'm going to show, I hope to have some, the opportunity to show some pictures of the, of the family uh, as we end this. And my, I, my daughter has a twin brother and he's in graduate school here at the University of Maryland in the biology. Wow. And... Uh, Last fall, he passed his PhD qualifying examinations. Right on. Uh, so he, and he works in the laboratory of a physicist. So he's going to be a biophysicist, it looks out, looks like. It looks like both kids are going to be some flavor yeah. of physics. Which is right. <laughs> weird and interesting, but yeah. uh, that's, that's who we are. Appreciate that. And, and so be, before we, and, and, and definitely at the at the end, you know, please feel free to, to pull up any pictures. But so our, our last question before we, we get a chance to see those pictures. Last question I, I wanted to ask you is, and, and before I ask, I just thank you so much for your time today. I thank you for, for your time. And I, and I, truly, like sincerely, 100% sincerely, I, I hope that we get another opportunity to do this um, sometime in the future, because this has been fantastic this journey that you've taken us on um down memory lane you know learning about your life your influence you know things that have influenced you along the way uh, people that have been a part of your village and and how you've you know continue to to pay it forward and that leads me to this last question what advice would you give anyone because you've you've mentored people you have you have paid it forward what advice would you give anyone uh who's interested in teaching and or mentoring uh, young people and how can and how can they make a a positive impact a positive impact so that's my last question and and then please this celestial 
um, backdrop you have after that. <laughs> if you could tell us what that is, because it's a fast thing. I had no idea until you told us before we actually uh, started recording. If you could tell us what that is and how that came to be as well. Okay, before we do that, can I... I'm going to talk about mentoring, but can I, I, I didn't talk about my youngest career, which is a public policy. Mm -hmm. So may I mention some words about that and then we can turn? You'll sure. Read. Okay, so let me share one more time here. And uh, let's see, let me go to this image. So uh, on the left-hand side of this table, there might be a person that you recognize. That would be Barack Hussein Obama, the president of the United States, number 45, uh, 44. And on the right-hand side of the picture, you'll see there's an African-American gentleman with, with relatively long black hair. Mm -hmm. That would be me uh, back around 212, about 10, just 10, 11 years ago. And, you know, everyone has seen pictures of the United States president where the hair goes from dark to gray. As you can see in this picture, my hair went from what you see there to what I have now. And so I tell people, you shouldn't stand too close to the president of the United States because your hair can turn into color just like his does. <laughs> so I was a member of President Obama's uh, Presidential Council of Advisors on Science and Technology from uh, 2009 to 2016. Uh, the other people, and this, this is a picture that's taken in the White House in one of our meetings. The person at the far end of the table is Dr. Shirley Jackson, who I pointed out was uh, she and I had the same uh, advisor uh, at MIT. This is the Medal of Science, which you mentioned earlier. And this is the Medal of Science event. As you can see in this bottom picture here, I'm whispering something into President Obama's ear. I made up a joke for him. And you can see the reaction to the joke in, the, in this set of panels. <laughs> Maybe your, uh, next, your next career is a stand-up comedian. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. Here's some more pictures uh, in meetings. The woman in the middle of us here is Valerie Jarrett. I don't know if any of your audience are into politics, but she's been an advisor to President Obama since, since he started politics in Chicago. Again, in a meeting. And I also know this guy. So uh, my policy career has gotten me into some very strange and interesting places. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, it, it has been a joy because as bad as, as unfair as this country is to some of its people, especially those of us who are African-American, you've got to keep trying to exceed the boundaries people place on you. And that's what I have done all my life. And to my surprise, sometimes it works. I'm not going to say it works all the time. I'm not going to say it works fairly. But don't give up on your dreams is what I tell people because I've never given up on mine. So that's my fourth career. And I think it was important for me to put that into the discussion. Um, and now let's get back to the mentoring question that you asked me. I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot to turn off my phone when we were here. Let me start it. Um, mentoring. Well, for me, mentoring started uh, even as I was a student um, so I want to go back and sorry, just a moment. Uh, I want to start mentoring here because this image that you're seeing here, these are all my high school teachers. Well, not all of them, but uh, a collection of my high school teachers. Ms. Weaver, Ms. Dudley, those are my English teachers. Ms. Uh, Williams was my geometry teacher. Mr. Saunders was uh, my um, Algebra two teacher. Mr. Patrick was my French teacher. And Mr. Coney was my physics teacher. I received superb mentoring, even though we didn't have the greatest resources at Jones High compared to the schools where European-American students went. I had fantastic teachers. 
And so I had models for mentors. However, the greatest mentor in my life is actually my father, uh, because my dad was in my 40s. I figured out my father was an extraordinarily unusual man. And uh, as one example of that, in 1998, I went to Iceland for my one and only visit in life. And when I got home, I found out my dad had been there 50 years earlier, and he had never told me that. And so I've had examples of mentoring all my life. And so the first thing I, I ask people who come to me with questions about mentoring, I ask, who were your mentors? Because one of the ways to get to be an effective mentor is to have been effectively mentored. And so to me, that's a very important question to ask. Who were your mentors? I've shown you a number of my mentors throughout this talk, uh, such as Professor Young, uh, Dr. Salam, uh, John Schwartz, Murray Gelman, uh, Richard Feynman, Peter Van Nievenhuizen, Uno Ingard, whose name I didn't mention, but who's my bachelor's thesis advisor at MIT. I've, I've had a galaxy of, of mentors. Most of my mentors have not been African-Americans. The majority of my mentors have been European American men. And so what I tell especially young people of color when it comes to this issue of mentors, a lot of there seems to be a sort of an often unstated um, belief that your mentor has to be someone like you. They have to share your gender, your ethnicity. And for a person of color, that's not going to work because if you're going to be working in these fields where very few of us have gone before, you're not going to be able to find people like you who can effectively be your mentor. So you have to be open to the idea that someone who doesn't look like you might have your best interest in heart, at heart and can help you make your dreams come true. So, so that has been the kind of experience I've had uh, as I navigated um, mentoring. I, you asked me for advice, Solomon. I don't actually give advice. Uh, what I'm willing to do is tell people what was useful for me when I was in a similar situation and what I did about it. And that's what I've just told you just now. And when you ask about this question, so I don't, I make it a habit not to give advice because I think to give advice requires that you know far more about the person you're giving the advice to than you likely do. So you have to be very careful in giving advice, but you know what happened to you and you know the outcomes. So you can easily share those. Makes a lot of sense. Another thing I wanted to, to highlight, because oftentimes when I talk about my life, people somehow think it was all laid out for me to, to do all that I do. And so there's one other thing I, I emphasize, especially for undergraduate students, and I'd like to concentrate on that for a second. You should be seeing an image of two things right now. Mm -hmm. It's an emoji with a tear, and there's a bowling ball. The emoji with a tear was me as a freshman at MIT, because I literally wept quite often alone at night over my homework. Going from, even though I had fantastic teachers at Jones High, I had not, I had never taken a calculus course before I got to MIT. Most of the people in physics had had calculus. So in order to make my dreams come true, there was pain involved. But I understood, and I didn't lose faith in myself nor my dreams. So one thing I often see in young African Americans as they especially come to universities, and especially many times when they're interested in STEM fields, they begin to doubt themselves. And as a consequence, they give up on their dreams. And so I like to just make sure that people understand that others have been there before. I know I have been there before. And by keeping faith in myself, I was able to make it. And so part of the message is when a student comes to me, I tell them, I believe in you. And you have to believe in you as strongly as I do. The other part of this image, which is uh, maybe confusing to you, it's a picture of a bowling ball. And uh, the reason I use it is because when I was at MIT, I was never very good at taking tests. I would walk into a test 
from a room where a test was being given. And for the first 20 minutes, I wouldn't have anything to say on the paper. And I would just sit there. After about 20 minutes, maybe my mind would start working a little bit. I, I might write out one or two things. And then some more time would pass, and I'd be writing faster and faster. So that by the end of the hour-long exam, I'm writing as fast as I can. But wait a minute. Everyone else had an hour to take their exam. I only had 40 minutes. That means that my tests were never going to look as good as many other students in the class. This built up tremendous frustration and anger and self-loathing. And these are negative emotions that when they come into your life, you have got to find a way to deal with them because they can destroy you. My way of dealing with these emotions was I learned to bowl. MIT had a bowling alley in the um, basement of the student union. I learned to bowl 16 pounds. I used a 16 pound ball. The bowling lane is about 90 feet long. And at the other end of the bowling alley, there are 10 pins. And I often tell students, you can imagine the faces of your teachers on those if you want to. And so you're hurling this ball down the lane and you can work the frustration out. Now, so whenever I had a bad test, I went to go bowling. In my last year at MIT, my team won the bowling championship. So that tells you how badly I performed on tests the entire time I was at MIT. Right. Not only that, but the two years that I was at Caltech as a postdoc, my team won the bowling championship, but it was two different teams and I was the only common player. I was essentially bowling at the level of a professional bowler. You have got to take negative energy in your life and turn it into something positive. And I think that's a very important thing to understand. Right. Appreciate that. Right on. Thank you so much. And uh, before we go, what, what is that behind you? Who drew that? Oh, yes, that image. Can I get to show my, my kids? Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Uh, so one one picture of the kids we talked about them a few moments ago. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this is my family. I'm very proud of them. My wife of 38 years, oh, 39 years actually, uh, is over on the uh, right hand side of this picture next to the president, and uh, those are my twins in front of me in this picture. And we've already talked about what they do. And that's the metal science around my neck. So not only, uh, I have tried to be a good father as well as a good husband. I think that many of us lose sight as we pursue our professional dreams, uh, that family is actually important. I've tried to have a balance in that. Uh, it's not easy to do. Uh, my wife and I, like I said, we've been married 39 years and we kid our friends that we're not sure it's going to work yet, so we're still trying to work it out after 39 years, but we're still working at it. And so I think that's important uh, for people to know, too, is that family has got to be a high priority in your life. At least I believe that's the case. So bring me back to bring me uh, home to this image. So let me uh, let me uh, first of all clear my computer here. So, uh, Solomon and I, as I, as we were warming up for this program, I, he asked about my background because he said it looks like a halo around my head, but that's not the reason why I use it as a background. I use it because I want people to understand what's going on in the world. This picture was painted by a computer. It's artificial intelligence. No human created this picture. The computer wasn't instructed to do this. There's a new technology. Well, it's not so it's about a decade old, but it's now coming to uh, blossom. There's a new technology called deep learning, where you train computers to think the way that humans do. And so literally this picture was created by one of these thinking computers, an artificial intelligence. The other thing in the news that if you've been listening carefully, there's this thing called chat GPT which is a piece of software that writes essays and answers questions. And it seems like it is a person. This is where our world is going. And for our community not to be engaged in this 
is a prescription for us to be written out of the benefits that will occur. And so the reason, one reason that I, and by the way, emotionally, I resonate with this painting, by the way. I think it's a beautiful painting. But if you look very carefully at it, and you can find this painting online, any of you can, just Google the words artificial intelligence painting, and you'll find this picture because it was all over the world. It was famous uh, about two or three months ago. But the point is, this is where our world, world is going. We as a community cannot afford to be left out of this revolution. And so that's part of the reason why I like to use this painting when I'm in Zoom, because it, it prompt, prompts people to ask, what is that behind you? Wow, I appreciate I appreciate you shedding light on that. Um, I had no idea about that painting until you told us before the uh, the interview. And uh, but I really, um, on behalf of, of Princess and and the entire Nambura Cultural Center staff and and our media collective, I mean, I really appreciate the time um, that you've carved out of your very busy schedule to to uh, have a conversation with us. We wanted it to be conversational, we, and, and that's exactly what this was. I wanted to learn more about your life and your influences and uh, things that you've done. And this is exactly what um, Princess and I, you know, wanted to come out of this when we were, you know, behind the scenes last night, you know, yeah. you know, going back and forth and, you know, which questions to ask. And, and you know, so I, I appreciate it. I really thank you so, so much. Well, thank you for the opportunity, Solomon, and you too, Princess, for hanging in there. Uh, I suspect that, uh, you might have been surprised by what happened in this interview, but uh, life is fun. If it, life is more fun with surprises, I have generally found. Thank you. Um, my name is Salman Kamajan. This is Princess Tatsi. Uh, we're a part of the Nambru Media Collective. That is the inimitable Dr. Sylvester Gates. Thank you, Sylvester Gates Jr. Um, Got to definitely, you know, pay homage to your father, as you said who, uh, you know, was a huge influence in your life and so many others. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate it. Until next time, peace. Bye.